Section 41 of The Valley of the Moon by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Chapter 6. They had taken the direct county road across the hills from Monterey instead of the seventeen mile drive around by the coast, so that Carmel Bay came upon them without any foreglimmering of its beauty. Dropping down through the pungent pines, they passed woods embowered cottages, quaint and rustic, of artists and writers, and went on across wind blown rolling sand hills held to place by sturdy lupine and nodding with pale California poppies. Saxon screamed in sudden wonder of delight, then caught her breath and gazed at the amazing peacock blue of a breaker shot through with golden sunlight, overfalling in a mile-long sweep and thundering into white ruin of foam on a crescent beach of sand scarcely less white. How long they stood and watched the stately procession of breakers rising from out the deep and wind-capped sea to froth and thunder at their feet, Saxon did not know. She was recalled to herself when, Billy laughing, tried to remove the telescope basket from her shoulders. "'You kind of look as though you was going to stop a while,' he said. "'So we might as well get comfortable.' "'I never dreamed it. I never dreamed it,' she repeated, with passionately clasped hands. "'I thought the surf at Cliff House was wonderful. But it gave no idea of this. Oh, look, look! Did you ever see such an unspeakable color?' and the sunlight flashing right through it. Oh, oh, oh! At last she was able to take her eyes from the surf and gaze at the sea horizon of deepest peacock blue, and piled with cloud masses, at the curve of the beach south to the jagged point of rocks, and at the rugged blue mountains seen across soft low hills landward up Carmel Valley. Might as well sit down and take it easy, Billy indulged her. This is too good to want to run away from all at once. She assented, but began immediately to unlace her shoes. You ain't going to, Billy asked in surprised delight, then began unlacing his own. Before they were ready to run barefoot on the perilous fringe of cream-wet sand where land and ocean met, a new and wonderful thing attracted their attention. Down from the dark pines and across the sand hills ran a man, naked, save for narrow trunks. He was smooth and rosy-skinned, cherubic-faced, with a thatch of curly yellow hair, but his body was hugely thewed as a Hercules. Gee, must be Sandow, Billy muttered low to Saxon but she was thinking of the engraving in her mother's scrapbook and of the Vikings on the wet sands of England. The runner passed them a dozen feet away, crossed the wet sand, never pausing, till the froth washed was to his knees, while above him, ten feet at least, upreared a wall of overtopping water. Huge and powerful as his body had seemed, it was now white and fragile in the face of that eminent great-handed buffet of the sea. Saxon gasped with anxiety, and she stole a look at Billy to note that he was tense with watching. But the stranger sprang to meet the blow, and just when it seemed he must be crushed, he dived into the face of the breaker and disappeared. The mighty mass of water fell in thunder on the beach, but beyond appeared a yellow head, one arm outreaching, and a portion of his shoulder. Only a few strokes was he able to make when he was compelled to dive through another breaker. This was the battle, to win seaward against the sweep of the shoreward hastening sea. Each time he dived and was lost to view, Saxon caught her breath and clenched her hands. Sometimes, after the passage of a breaker, they could not find him, and when they did, he would be scores of feet away, flung there like a chip by a smoke-bearded breaker. Often it seemed he must fail and be thrown upon the beach, but at the end of half an hour 
he was beyond the outer edge of the surf and swimming strong, no longer diving but topping the waves. Soon he was so far away that only at intervals could they find the speck of him. That too vanished, and Saxon and Billy looked at each other. She was amazement at the swimmer's valor. Billy with blue eyes flashing. Some swimmer, that boy, some swimmer, he praised. Nothing chicken-hearted about him. Say, I only know tank swimming and bay swimming, but now I'm going to learn ocean swimming. If I could do that, I'd be so proud you couldn't come within forty feet of me. Why, Saxon, honest to God, I'd sooner do what he done than own a thousand farms. Oh, I can swim, too. I'm telling you like a fish. I swum one Sunday from the narrow gauge pier to Sessions Basin, and that's Miles, and I never seen anything like that guy in the swimming line. And I'm not going to leave this beach until he comes back, all by his lonely out there in a mountain sea. Think of it. He's got his nerve all right, all right. Saxon and Billy ran barefooted up and down the beach, pursuing each other with brandished snakes of seaweed, and playing like children for an hour. It was not until they were putting on their shoes that they sighted the yellow head bearing shoreward. Billy was at the edge of the surf to meet him, emerging, not white-skinned as he had entered, but red from the pounding he had received at the hands of the sea. "'You're a wonder, and I've just got to hand it to you,' Billy greeted him in outspoken admiration. "'It was a big surf today,' the young man replied, with a nod of acknowledgment. "'It don't happen that you're a fighter I never heard of,' Billy queried, striving to get some inkling of the identity of the physical prodigy. The other laughed and shook his head, and Billy could not guess that he was an ex-captain of a Varsity Eleven, and incidentally the father of a family and the author of many books. He looked Billy over with an eye, trained in measuring freshman aspirants for the gridiron. You're some body of a man, he appreciated. You'd strip with the best of them. Am I right in guessing that you know your way about in the ring? Billy nodded. My name's Roberts. The swimmer scowled with a futile effort at recollection. Bill, Bill Roberts, Bill, he supplemented. Ho, ho, not big Bill Roberts. Why, I saw you fight before the earthquake in the mechanics pavilion. It was a preliminary to Eddie Hanlon and some other fellow. You're a two-handed fighter, I remember that, with an awful wallop, but slow. Yes, I remember. You were slow that night, but you got your man. He put out a wet hand. My name's Hazard, Jim Hazard. And if you're the football coach that was a couple of years ago, I've read about in the papers. Am I right? They shook hands heartily, and Saxon was introduced. She felt very small beside the two young giants, and very proud withal that she belonged to the race that gave them birth. She could only listen to them talk. I'd like to put on the gloves with you every day for half an hour, Hazard said. You could teach me a lot. Are you going to stay around here? No, we're going on down the coast looking for land. Just the same, I could teach you a few. And there's one thing you could teach me, surf swimming. I'll swap lessons with you any time, Hazard offered. He turned to Saxon. Why don't you stop in Carmel for a while? It isn't so bad. It's beautiful, she acknowledged with a grateful smile, but she turned and pointed to their packs on the edge of the lupine. We're on the tramp and looking for government land. If you're looking down past the sir for it, it will keep, he laughed. Well, I've got to run along and get some clothes on. If you come back this way, look me up. Anybody will tell you where I live. So long. And as he had first arrived, he departed, crossing the sand hills on the run. Billy followed him with admiring eyes. Some boy, some boy, he murmured. Why, Saxon, he's famous. If I'd have seen his face in the papers once, I'd have seen it a thousand times. And he ain't a bit stuck on himself, just man to man. Say, 
I'm beginning to have faith in the old stock again. They turned their backs on the beach and, in the tiny main street, bought meat, vegetables, and a half a dozen eggs. Billy had to drag Saxon away from the window of a fascinating shop where were iridescent pearls of abalone set and unset. Abalones grow here all along the coast, Billy assured her, and I'll get you all you want. Low tides to time. My father had a set of cuff buttons made of abalone shell, she said. They were set in pure soft gold. I haven't thought about them for years, and I wonder who has them now. They turned south. Everywhere, from among the pines, peeped the quaint pretty houses of the artist folk, and they were not prepared, where the road dipped in the Carmel River, for the building that met their eyes. I know what it is, Saxon almost whispered. It's an old Spanish mission. It's the Carmel mission, of course. That's the way the Spaniards came up from Mexico, building missions as they came and converting the Indians. Until we chased them out, Spaniards and Indians, whole kitten caboodle, Billy observed with calm satisfaction. Just the same, it's wonderful, Saxon mused, gazing at the big, half-ruined adobe structure. There is the Mission Dolores in San Francisco, but it's smaller than this and not as old. Hidden from the sea by low hillocks, forsaken by human being and human habitation, the church of sun-baked clay and straw and chalk rock stood hushed and breathless in the midst of the adobe ruins, which once had housed its worshipping thousands. The spirit of the place descended upon Saxon and Billy, and they walked softly, speaking in whispers, almost afraid to go in through the open ports. There was neither priest nor worshiper, yet they found all the evidence of use by a congregation which Billy judged must be small from the number of benches. Later, they climbed the earthquake-racked belfry, noting the hand-hewn timbers, and in the gallery, discovering the pure quality of their voices. Saxon trembling at her own temerity, softly sang the opening bars of Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Delighted with the result, she leaned over the railing, gradually increasing her voice to its full strength as she sang, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, let me to thy bosom fly, while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is nigh. Hide me, O my Savior, hide. Till the storm of life is past, safe into the haven, guide, and receive my soul at last. Billy leaned against the ancient wall and loved her with his eyes, and when she had finished, he murmured, almost in a whisper, That was beautiful, just beautiful, and you ought to have seen your face when you sang. It was as beautiful as your voice. Ain't it funny? I never think of religion, except when I think of you. They camped in the willow bottom, cooked dinner, and spent the afternoon on the point of low rocks north of the mouth of the river. They had not intended to spend the afternoon, but found themselves too fascinated to turn away from the breakers bursting upon the rocks and from the many kinds of colorful sea life, starfish, crabs, mussels, sea anemones, and once in a rock pool a small devilfish that chilled their blood when it cast the hooded net of its body around the small crabs they tossed to it. As the tide grew lower, they gathered a mess of mussels, huge fellows, five and six inches long, and bearded like patriarchs. Then, while Billy wandered in a vain search for abalones, Saxon lay and dabbled in the crystal-clear water of a rock pool, dipping up handfuls of glistening jewels, ground bits of shell and pebble, of flashing rose and blue and green and violet. Billy came back and lay beside her, lazing in the sea-cooled sunshine, and together they watched the sun sink into the horizon where the ocean was deepest peacock blue. She reached out her hand to Billy's and sighed with sheer repletion of content. It seemed she had never lived such a wonderful day. 
It was as if all old dreams were coming true. Such beauty of the world she had never guessed in her fondest imagining. Billy pressed her hand tenderly. What was you thinking of, he asked, as they arose finally to go. Oh, I don't know, Billy. Perhaps that it was better one day like this than ten thousand years in Oakland. End of section 41